We're going to cover a story tonight out of um, the same place where we uh, covered the – if you'll remember a couple of weeks ago, we, we did a, a show about um, officers responding to the wrong house for a domestic, but the person inside didn't know what was happening, so they came out with their gun presented like they were going to shoot the officers. The officers shot them. Uh, it was in Farmington, New Mexico. This is the same place. And what happened was there was an 18-year-old kid. Um, he was uh, depressed, according to his mom, on a 911 call. And uh, he just decided to end his life in another suicide by cop situation. I'm assuming that's what happened because he actually says it at one point in one of the, uh, in one of the, the calls but, or one of the uh, recordings that you'll hear. He got a hold of his AR-15 and plenty of rounds of ammunition. He started firing at will from his residence. He didn't. He wasn't like a typical school shooter that went into a school. He just did it from his house or his street or whatever. He just walked up and down his street, um, and he did some damage. I mean, he 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 injured six people. He killed three people. John uh, sent me the ages of these people when we were kind of planning the show, and it was devastating to read. So I'll tell you, he killed a 97-year-old woman and her 73-year-old daughter. Think about that. She made it to 97, and she was taken out by this punk 18-year-old shithead with, uh, you know, that just decided today was his day. You know, how I'll, selfish. I'll, I'll read their names because I think. Yeah, please. A, if it's a tradition that we're going to cover this stuff, maybe it should be a tradition that we remember them. And I apologize if I don't get the names right. The news agencies also mention the names. Shirley Voita. Gwendolyn Schofield and Melody Ivy. We remember your lives and thank you for all the good that you did. And lots of people there in your community in Farmington speak volumes of you. Even when someone in the chats is uh, saying that they are kind of a friend of a friend or associated with you guys uh, who have passed on and nothing but good things to say, Drew. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mrs. Ivy was, um, she ran a daycare or something to that effect i mean just yeah like... and and she had a waiting list because she was like some like and and i could be getting my people confused here, and i apologize but like she was like legendary for like being really excellent and trustworthy and anybody you know wanted wanted these people to be involved in their kids lives and like how valuable is that all the more now you know like people that you could trust to to be a part of raising your children in the correct way and you just can trust them and nothing terrible will happen and and of course, all the irony is that, you know, uh, as someone who something went wrong in their lives, you know, maybe they didn't have somebody like this uh, to help them, you know, was involved in the taking of theirs. It's very sad. True. Very, very sad. Um, I'm going to pull the uh, the video from the text message because I that's one thing I forgot to do unless you have it loaded. I have loaded? I've got audio of the 911 dispatch calls from uh, Let's start with the 911 dispatch then. From this is a, a 2 minute and 30 second news cl clip. This is from some kind of news agency called uh KQ or excuse me KRQE. I'm guessing it's uh the affiliate out of Albuquerque. Right. And I'll, I'll go ahead and play that for you. It's uh, audio only for your viewing pleasure. You still get to look at Andrew's beard. Farmington police were overwhelmed with hundreds of calls that morning as panicked community members called pleading for help, describing the shooter and alerting dispatchers that people were hurt. It's getting closer to my house. A barrage of gunfire. What's he look like? I can't tell. I took a quick look, but bullets are going everywhere. May 15th, Farmington dispatchers received hundreds of calls about an active shooter their quiet neighborhood under attack. I've heard at least 50 rounds here. Somebody's going nuts. Callers begging police to hurry while taking cover in homes. There's a guy shooting a gun outside. Okay, Dad, I hear you. Honey, stay down there. I don't. Stay for quick. More than 200 calls incoming as police say 18-year-old Bo Wilson was relentlessly shooting at people driving by his home. Sounds like, uh, like maybe an AK or an AR-15, and it's still going on. Others describing what the suspect looked like. There's a guy walking that has black pants and a black shirt on and a gun, and he's just randomly shooting. Amid the chaos, citizens were helping direct traffic away from the gunfire. There's gunshots going on. Don't go down there. Don't go down there. At one point, the shooter's own mother made a call to police. I have a son that's been 
um, very, very depressed. And I'm driving over there. I'm just wondering if you could give me any information. Nonstop panicked calls, but dispatchers remained calm. I'm going to let you go. We've got lots of calls coming in. During his violent rampage, Wilson killed three elderly women, Shirley Voida, Melody Ivy, and Gwendolyn Schofield. A lady in the car, and it looks like there was a bullet that went to the windshield, and she's bleeding bad. Six other people were injured, including two police officers. One victim drove through the ambush to pick up her grandchild from school. Um, her vehicle has been shot several times. She has wounds on her hand and she needs medical attention. Another victim shot in the head was taken to the ER by his daughter. I'm actually at the hospital right now, but I just wanted to let you guys know my dad got shot. I dropped him off at the ER, but he got shot. Eight minutes from that first 911 call, police close in on the gunman, killing him. I got cuffs right here. Cuff him. All right, so that was from KRQE. You could hear that uh, the dispatchers were uh, overwhelmed. The important thing there was not just that uh, you had a whole bunch of uh, you know people reporting the same thing, that someone was out there spraying the city with bullets. You could hear, as they were talking, you could hear the phone ringing in the background. And at one point, that one dispatcher says, okay, I'm going to let you go. We have lots of calls coming in. You kind of have to do that to let them know, hey, stop talking, and I'm going to hang up. Sometimes some agencies have problems with you just cutting it off like that. Um, but as we've discussed here multiple times, anytime where you have a mass casualty incident and you have so many 911s come in, you can't triage it. If you think you've gotten all the information out of one, you just got to try to move on. Drew? Yeah, uh, this is something that we've uh, covered extensively. I mean, I, I don't know what perspective you're coming from, like if you're a listener right now, but understand like that's pure chaos and mayhem. I, I don't know how many operators they had on duty and they they received a flood of over 100 calls. And there was, I, I don't know if it was in this news report, I don't, I don't remember hearing it, but um, th there was uh, something about um, one of the operators saying, look, I, I got to let you go. I've got to get other information. And th that's, that's unnerving to the caller. Yeah. It's unnerving to the dispatcher. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, it's unnerving to everybody, but it's, it's routine. It's like, it's what you have to do. It's, it's, uh. I don't know. It's just a scary feeling, I think. Judging from the size of San Juan County, they've got about 121,000. That's from the last census. And they've probably got outlying areas that they cover too. I would guess maybe four or five dispatchers, which so, you know, what's the multiplier there? You can't handle 200 calls. And we talked about this before with Uvalde. Um, you know, your 911 system, okay? So we're talking about a piece of like technological infrastructure here. You can't have 200 calls coming into the same place at the same time, just like you can't get 200 phone calls from your friends on your cell phone. So a 911 line is a dedicated phone line. You know, of course, it, it might go through the internet. If you're in an older place, it might be an actual phone line. Um, but a phone line will get busy. And so what happens after that point is that it usually, and this will vary by state, but it gets rerouted somewhere else. So you have all these other PSAPs, a public safety access point kind of in the area. They're going to be getting these calls after 30 seconds. So what you have is nine, people calling 911, it ringing for 30, 35 seconds. And then somebody in some other county in New Mexico or elsewhere is answering this. And they're like, why are we getting a phone call from Farmington, New Mexico? Uh, every time I get a 911 phone call from like, you know, 100 miles away, I just I can't. It immediately throws me. And so the process is, is that they'll talk to that person, gather information. So somebody in public safety is aware of what's going on. They can at least get some kind of detail um, if they need to send state reinforcements. Usually they'll have state radio there or some other way of accessing some kind of help out of outside of Farmington to send that way. And then eventually they're just going to try to transfer the call back to Farmington because it's their baby. They own it. So when you have that many calls coming in, not only can the dispatchers locally in Farmington not handle it, but it's affecting a wide area. And of course, just to kind of sum this up here, you still have all the same stuff going on. You still have babies choking. You still have cars crashing. Right. You still have That's overdue motorists. You still have welfare checks. You still have... 911 ass dials and it's all choking and clogging the system and not everyone else who needs help of course that morning's not going to get it either drew go ahead yeah that, that's the one thing that people often uh, forget about or you know we like to remind you that life goes on around you so if if it's a, a high volume call uh, call center anyway um you know an active shooter like that's going to throw uh a wrench in and it's definitely going to eat up a lot of resources very quickly but 
the rest of the citizens still, you know, they don't know what's going on, you know, 20 miles down the road and they've had somebody break into their car. Now, obviously you're going to triage, you know, what you're going to respond to and you're going to have to level with people like, Hey, you you know, you're probably not going to get anybody quickly, but um, so I'm seeing here, Farmington's a metro area of about 65,000 people, just uh, probably not a huge comm center. I think they serve like, if I'm not mistaken, like 10 or 12 agencies. Yeah. Uh, within that San, one San Juan center. County for sure. I mean, I'm not sure. Cause even San Juan County dispatch may serve other smaller counties. Yeah. Sometimes counties will have like, um, they actually contract that out just because it can be so expensive to run a comm center that it can right. be cheaper to pay a neighbor to do it. So it's possible. And I would, you know, if someone in San Juan County, uh, has a skinny on that and you know how your dispatch works, I guess, you know, get in touch with me and let me know. Cause I'd be curious how many people were on duty particularly during the, the day shift, because this was like at 11 a.m. You know, let me know how many people were in there handling calls. Well, he, here's the other thing, too. And, and you mentioned Uvalde a little bit, but so we'll talk about Parkland for a second. When those uh, 911 calls started rolling in, there, there are municipalities in South Florida that used to before, you know, everything was changed by legislation. But they used to battle over, you know, this is all about tax districts and and tax bases and all, and all this other stuff. So not to take you too deep, but there were jurisdictions like that just bumped up next to one another and the county would handle this side of the street and the city would handle this side of the street and they didn't necessarily get along. And this city bumps up to this city and they definitely don't get along and they don't talk to one another. And well, that, that's what was happening. There were, there were a bunch of 911 calls coming into a fire department. The fire department starts rolling to Parkland uh, for the active shooter, because they're assuming that there are casualties, uh, somehow mistakenly, one of the officers finds out. Uh, I don't know that the school resource officer was able to call or had the information at the same time. There's there's a whole different story about you know his situation uh, that I don't want to get into because I think he's still awaiting trial. But you know, um, so uh, th- these things happen. Like this is this is you know it's called communications, but it doesn't necessarily mean everybody communicates. No. And when when you're getting information from thirty or forty different s- sources, and you got like one, you know, th- one tip of the spear, so to speak, that's supposed to be relaying information. If you don't relay the proper information, people end up dying, and that's that's the the, the sad truth behind the whole thing. Yeah. So, one other one other interesting aspect of this call, Drew, um, and I think maybe you were. Uh, flapjacking for that but you mentioned it though is that uh, at one point the boy's mother calls and she says i'm heading down there can you give me any information isn't this just eerily similar to the louisville bank shooting yes. where we had the 911 caller call in and say you know my son's down there he's in an agitated state he doesn't have access to guns but i'm going down there and the 911 dispatcher has to plead with her do not go down there you know right. number one we have no idea what a psychological effect you're gonna have on him you might be calming you might be agitating but you're also just a potential casualty at this point. Like once bullets are firing and firing in this fashion, and as you'll see in the video, he's just lighting up everything. Um, You know, I don't, I don't think anything would have stopped him from indiscriminately killing his mother because of every, the way that he's firing bullets, he's, he's hitting people by accident in addition to intentionally. Well, that's a good segue into uh, being able to watch it. So let's see what happens here. This was expertly put together by our, co-host john this is uh, also from this police can... activity this has some graphic content in it so you're seeing on the screen uh, a ring doorbell camera you'll you'll see some shots in the distance uh if you can see the there's a yellow house directly across from the carport you'll see smoke little smoke you know things uh pop here and there uh but listen to what he's saying oh, kill me come kill me he says uh so it looks like a very calm scene at the moment he says, fuck y'all. <laughs> 11, 12. <laughs> We're up to 16 shots fired. There's a white minivan coming in to the to the frame of the ring doorbell. Um, we believe this is what the old uh, the the uh, elderly women were were in. Uh, yeah, or they... somebody was. I believe it was them. If you watch as it rolls over to the left, and this is, you know, not a great vantage point, but it, it rolls on the screen from right to left. At one point, he, he'll he he'll shoot off a volley of rounds, and you can see that the, the vehicle is no longer in control. It doesn't have that, you know, kind of aggressive driving thing. It's like someone's it's, foot slid off the gas. Yeah, it comes it's kind of eerie, stop actually. 
Yeah, it, it is eerie because you know the driver's been wounded. And then the vehicle comes to a stop, unfortunately, right in front of him. And uh, don't, you know, look close, I guess, if you want to. But you'll basically see the smoke coming off of his off, off of his weapon. And uh, again, there's a volley of shots when you watch. Uh, just remember, just remember, this is not sounds you're hearing. OK, this is these are people being violently killed. And so I just I just want you to remember that as a, as a podcast listener, it's kind of repetitive. You're just hearing shots firing. But if you watch this you will see people's lives being extinguished. He's firing into their vehicle. He's killing them. And at one point, he, he fires a volley of shots. And then, and then there's two more to, to put them down. Another vehicle behind is going to turn away. Go ahead, Drew. So it's just kind of a slow, like you'll see a slow roll. Like it's just, it's sad. <laughs> So you that's, know what that is. And that's we're up them to th- being murdered. We're up to 36 shots, by the way. So now ca- traffic is coming down the street like normal because they don't know what's going on. And as they're going by. We're up to 52 shots. As they're going by, he's just picking these cars off left and right like a wild man. There's so what car happens is, yeah, the, the red car, there's a red car in front and it starts getting hit. There's a white car that's uh, a white minivan looking thing that's following kind of closely. It sees what's happening. So the white minivan slams on its brakes and you'll see what happened. He, he just gets in, uh, goes in reverse and tries to hightail it out there. So he's in reverse now. Um, the shooter is down the road a little bit, off to the left. So that that's the red car. It, uh, it U-turned and hightailed out of there, and we're up to 67 shots already. Come kill me, he says. We're up to 80 shots. So what we're going to see is the body camera from the first officer. This is a, we'll call him out officer badass because he was, or he is. Uh, did you stop? I did because you get to only have five seconds to let you talk. Go ahead. Go for it. I'm at Dustin and Navajo. Be advised. This guy is right in front of the church. Oh, I see him. Can you get all Behind the that? car, sir. I'm just going home. Get behind the car now. I'm going home. Good. I have eyes on the suspect. He's walking south. He's wearing all black, skinny. He's in front of the Methodist Church, walking southbound on Dustin. So what you didn't catch was the, uh, the there's a citizen that's walking, or you may have caught it, but there's a citizen that, that's walking with him. And uh, he starts telling him, he's the, the citizen is describing and the officer saying, hey, get in your house, just get in your house. And he's like, well, he's right down there. And he said, I know, just get in your house. And he said, I think he's got an automatic weapon. And he gets right on the radio and and, and says, uh, repeats all of that. Go ahead. And, and dispatch is, if you listen closely, you can hear that radio traffic. They're in a mode where they're repeating everything that you that the officer is saying on the scene. And that's so that units who are responding, if they miss it, if they don't have their portable on or if they're just waking up that way, if they just missed it, they they can listen to one person say what just happened. And the officer who's talking says, I know for sure the help's coming. I know for sure my dispatcher heard me. And so you're going to hear the dispatcher repeating things also to make sure I got it right. You want extra units on Navajo and Dustin Street or whatever it is. Drew, go ahead. Yeah, it's got to be surreal, and uh, everybody is calm f- given the situation. This guy knows what he's walking into. He can hear the f- he can hear the gunshots. He can see the guy. I'm being told he's got an automatic weapon. They fired the police. See your hands. He's carrying a rifle in front of him. He's got it ready. Now he's jogging. He's getting ready to engage the suspect. Through a nice suburban neighborhood. So he's taking cover behind a white vehicle. I don't know. I don't he just know. took off White House, directly south of the church. More shots are being fired. Sarge, stop right there. Stop right there. 
Okay, so what you're seeing, if you're watching us, is a stereoscopic view of both body cams. It is uh, the uh, body camera one of the the guy at top, and then it is, uh, I believe, his sergeant at the at the um, at the bottom. Make a contact team. Give me another unit to Dustin and Apache. Dustin and Navajo. Right here. Follow me. Right up here by the White House. White House on the left east side. Julian, I have Sarge. A couple of detectives with me. Where'd he go? Get back inside, people! Okay, the bottom picture is the sergeant, and she was hit. She was hit by a, bu a bullet, I think in her leg or her foot, um, obviously painful. She even gets back up uh, and tries to run, and she can't. I, I think her leg is probably rendered useless, and, and, and she, she does the best that she can to get out of there. Uh, and you'll see how quickly they uh, get everything under control, to include the shooter and her injury and everybody else's injuries. Suckers is down! She's fired! She's fired! Okay, what you just heard him yell was, shooter is down, cease fire, cease fire. Right? So the next right time off of, you... Right off of the range rules, yeah, so that they'll respond to that. Go ahead, Drew. The next time you hear someone tell you, oh, they shot him 61 times because everybody just wanted to empty their magazine, remember those... Remember the chaos that you just saw. Remember that this this officer ran probably about a quarter mile. And I'm telling you, when you're in full duty gear, you're it's not it's it's not even the equivalent to football gear. It's probably an extra thirty pounds worth of stuff. It's your duty belt, your asp, your handcuffs, your handgun, two magazines fully loaded, one in your gun that's fully loaded. So all those rounds they, they weigh. Um, your flashlight, so that's that's on the belt. Then on your vest, I mean, you have your vest on, so obviously you got that. It's hot out. It's New Mexico. You got uh, your boots on. You've got a uh, full-on uh, M16 rifle or, or uh, AR-15 rifle, and uh, you know that is hard to do without losing. Uh, like you lose the blood in your legs very quickly and you end up a, lo a lot of officers end up tripping or falling over because the uh, the blood rushes, you know, it's trying, you're trying to get blood into your head so you can think a little bit, but this guy ran about a quarter mile, maybe half mile. Um, and after these things, he's giving directions the whole time. His adrenaline is spiked uh, again. We're going on a scale of one to 10, probably at 30, uh, he's lived two lifetimes, you know, just in this incident alone before he even got to the shooter. He's got to worry about the sergeant. He's got to worry about um, uh, he's worrying about everything. There's, there are detectives that showed up. I know that there's discussion about him using his portable radio. Listen, the lapel mic is a, is a luxury in some agencies. Um, and it wasn't until recent, you know, I, I worked in a very progressive agency, probably 3,500 strong. And it wasn't until the last three or four years that we started issuing earpieces and, and mics that, that go right on your uniform. Uh, even when I was on the street, just recently when I retired, I still carried a portable radio. I mean, I, I didn't have a lapel mic. It's, it's not that I didn't have one or I couldn't have got, uh, couldn't get one. It's uh, I chose to use it that way. That's just how I learned to use the radio. And that's how I, I learned to tune into to the radio to keep it at that distance. So the volume wouldn't be, uh, distracting, but so there's all of that and there's all of that going on. And then he still had the wherewithal to, you know, once you neutralize the threat, Hey, everyone stop shooting. Cause we're responsible for every bullet that leaves our guns here. And then you're going to see what he does uh, right after that. We're securing. Do it. Just the fire by place. We're seven, one, three, North. Give me a medic here. Do not move! Do not move! Here, it comes right here. 
Cough him. Here we go. Fork to it. Subject is down. He is secured. We need 55. We can't take. Okay. Bulk is down. So right after the oh. end of this video, they start doing CPR on him. Yes, you'll see the, the there's a, a detective in a checked shirt. He's he's doing CPR. He's he's doing rescue efforts on him. I mean, that's that's your responsibility. It's it's neutralize the threat, but it's also you, you you're responsible for saving a life. So if he's if he's not actively shooting anymore and you've removed the threat, you've got to flip that switch. That's another thing that people don't either think about or realize or uh, it's not an execution. You, you you don't get you know. And if you don't act quick enough, that goes into your indictment. That'll go into that'll yeah. go into the factor of whether they're going to arrest you or not. So this is what I'm. You know, I started the top of the show talking about some stupid discourse with that Discord that I had in in, in chats. But this is what I'm saying: split second decisions, everything falling down on you at once, having to get everything one one hundred percent right one hundred percent of the time. Um, in an absolutely split second uh, decisions, that is kind of what you signed up for. However, it's not going to go 100 percent, 100 percent of the time. It just doesn't. It, it, it's human beings that are operating these systems. Luckily, this happened this way. Luckily, natural happened the way it happened. Unfortunately, Uvalde happened the way it happened. Unfortunately, um, uh, Marjorie Stillman Douglas happened the way it happened. It, it just, it's, it's, it's kind of environmental factors luck of the draw there's just so much that goes into these things but um you know they neutralized the threat here and they went they went right to rescue efforts to try to save this kid now drew i have a question to ask you i texted you this last night and i'm not a police officer so i'm here to speak for you non-cops out there the sailor made a great made a great point this is what i was asking you last night drew now i know uh you know there's always an ideal that you know we looking back after the fact well why didn't we do this and I don't, so I'm not really here to play that game. I'm not here criticizing Farmington PD. Like, good job to you guys. Why didn't they run of them with a car? Because that's what I feel like I would do. Drew, go okay. ahead and just discuss that. That's uh, that's a great uh, question. It's a great point. Listen, deadly force is deadly force. So however you choose to use deadly force, that's on you. If, if this is a a, uh, a situation that is likely to to uh, an imminent threat of death or great bodily harm to yourself or to someone else, you are authorized to use deadly force and how you carry out that deadly force is kind of your business, but you're going to have to answer to it. Well, totality um, of circumstances, like with a gun, you can't just say like, okay. uh, I saw somebody getting the shit kicked out of him. So I ran, like ran over the guy that was kicking the yeah, shit out that, of him. Like it's not you don't have circumstances in that case. Like you don't know what's going on necessarily. So, so I'm not, I'm not telling like people in the audience to just go start running people down as they deem appropriate. Cause it's no. not going to work out for you. So would running him over be authorized? I, I would say the answer is yes. Cause he was actively shooting. I think that yes. the, the, ex, the circumstances were ex extenuating. Would running him over be a good idea? I would say the answer is no, because you're going to put yourself that much closer to a guy with a high powered rifle yeah. that already murdered two people in a, in a moving vehicle anyway. So, um, th there are explicit policies that talk about not shooting from a moving vehicle, but again, those aren't absolute. Um, so you, you've got to factor that in, in the totality. And then just, um, you know, I, I don't, you even hear him on the radio saying, turn right there, turn right there. Okay. Stop because he doesn't want to put her any closer to where she needs to be. Uh, you still need some kind of cover or concealment, kind of like what we were talking about last week. Can Great I question. I, though. Can I push it as an item of discussion just for like point and counterpoint devil's advocate? Do you mind that? No, go for it. So they're marching. It's they're marching, you know, slowly into the more and more into the effective range of this rifle. It's it, in my view, you know, it's a lot easier to kind of like, and I don't think this 18 you know, kids a sniper by any means, but to get it, to get an accurate beat on your target, if you really, you know, and I don't know what kind of mental state he's in, but if you really did want to, like, if you see somebody, you know, advancing straight for you, they're coming in a line, you know, it seems like maybe you have a tactical advantage there. Also, we discussed this last week or the week before, but like, I think in Indi the Indianapolis case, like having some cover being better than none. I know that three of these guys were detectives, so they didn't have armor on. Wouldn't sure. the wouldn't the armor of a big block engine, you know, like in their 
and their uh, Ford Taurus SHO, wouldn't that be better than nothing? I mean, just to play devil's advocate, and because I think it would have been an awesome way to end the case. Go ahead. It would have been an awesome way to end the case. However, uh, let me let me just run this scenario. <laughs> yes, you. Run it. I love it. And I have another point after this. Go ahead. Uh, he walks in between two houses. Or you crash the car <laughs> near him, and like you like hit uh, a fence or a storm drain, and then you're like trapped there, and he just lights you up like the right. other car. No, that, that's hydrant. problematic. The other thing is that what my sister said, she made a good point. Like, so let's suppose you advance on him and you give him verbal commands, and he complies. He throws the gun down, puts his hands up, puts his hands behind his head, gets down on his knees, full felony stop. You can arrest the guy. Like if you're if you're barreling at him at 80 miles an hour with a car, there's no verbal commands. And even if he surrenders, you know, it's it's uh, you would have, it, so you'd really have some explaining to do. But I mean, like, because <laughs> we have talked about that before. I mean, even even the Uvalde shooter, if, if the Uvalde shooter was standing there, just like the top shooter in Buffalo, he, he came out and he laid his gun down at his feet and put his hands up. You don't get to execute the guy just because, you know, he, he killed the X amount of people, you know, God rest their souls. You, you don't get, even if it's 18 children and two teachers or 19 children and two teachers, you don't get to execute him. You, you want to, well, but he's, I, he's gotta be an active threat in order for you to yeah. shoot him. So if he's got his gun in his feet, you're right. Like, and, he, and, he, uh, that dash cam footage is going to look so bad at your trial when he turns around and gets down on his knees <laughs> and you're like, you like swerve the wheel at the last second. So you know, it's wrong. Thunk, thunk. And you're like, well, yeah, and, and well, I, like yeah. I, I could see myself at the defendant's table, just looking at the jury like this. Like, <laughs> I mean, what do you want? Like, he throws what what his hands and shrugs. It goes like, <laughs> he killed three old ladies. Okay, <laughs> right? I, like, I, I got, I got to wipe yeah. out. You know, we, we, <laughs> we, we played a little GTA there. You know, I don't know. No, I guess it's not a good idea. I would not exclude it for being. I would not so, say it's a bad idea. Like, it really depends on the totality, right? Like. No, so we can we we can say all we want. Like he, he you know, Silly Mander's making great points here, and she's in in you know in the conversation. If we were just, you know, at the bar having a few beers or whatever of yeah. what we would do, then yeah, maybe. But the thing that the reality is this: you you have to get things one hundred percent right a hundred percent of the time, yeah. or one of two things will happen: one, you may be shot. And and in that path, you may be killed, or two, you may be indicted. Yes, and life, you may go to prison for the rest life of your prison, life. Prison, you know. And, and and we're talking about microseconds to make these decisions. Yeah. Uh, these it, it officers does, handle it. And you know what, I, I John, I, I wondered last night, and I like, you know, they did. I, I know that they released the sergeant's name. They redacted it in some of the news stories, but I know that it's out there. But. I wonder if any of these officers were actually involved in the other shooting because it's the same police department. They Which, can't be that big. I don't well, know. There's not only that, but there was a school shooting there in 2017. So you make a good point about the officers who certainly, you know, are psychologically changed by the fact that they had this officer go up to the wrong house and ended up shooting somebody in a blink of an eye. Like that affects you, whether or not you think it was right or wrong. That's changing the way that you police after watching that video. And I encourage anyone who hasn't seen or listened to that episode to go back to the other Farmington episode. So you've got that. And then you've got this other 2017 shooting right there in Farmington that you probably have some by now veterans working on. And you also just have the whole climate of this country that no matter what you do is wrong. And and yeah. uh, I agree that, you know, grabbing the rifle, you, you're reverting to your training when you're under stress. So that makes sense. No, you haven't been trained to like, uh, you know, it's not in the SOP manual to go grab a car and, and mow someone down. Would you be legally protected if the circumstances and the totality were right? Maybe, you know, but uh, it it it's 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 almost safer to just say like I I went according to farming Farmington PD policy and tactical policy, which was to stack up, approach the subject, give commands. Oh, you know, you're just yeah, going to be glad, covered that way. I'm glad you said that. So. Uh, because I, I actually have been in a situation like this, and, and this is a case that we we definitely need to cover at some point. The 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 optimal thing to do, he, he is doing the best he can at communicating with everybody around him and and making sure they know what's in front of them and you know guiding them in the right direction and all that. But they're spread out, and there are people that are wearing plain clothes without uh, armor. They're they're you know they're selfless, so they're in the they're in the fight with him, but. Um, 
it does present some crossfire issues sometimes, which is the whole point of forming up in a diamond formation or, fi- or forming up in a stack. And, you know, if you're going to go through a building and systematically search, that's exactly what you do. And that's why you do it. So you're not in crossfire situations and you, you do have all four um, compass points covered when you're looking, uh, you know, or 16 actually uh, compass points covered when you're, when you're uh, advancing. In this situation, it's just, <laughs> it's a line of people moving at, uh, it, it's like an octopus puss kind of swimming towards a guy. And it's, uh, it's very dangerous for everybody involved. Um, right. Th- and so you do, for you to accomplish the same thing with a, with a car, you're basically going to have to Mario Kart the guy, which is also cool. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, right. <laughs> well, you could have just thrown a banana peel at that point. But uh, so... Um, that's that's just it's another thing to think about. I, the, the the scenario that I was in, the guy started shooting. We were in an apartment complex. He had already committed sexual battery on a room full of people. This is no joke. Uh, he committed a sexual battery in another apartment complex behind us. He had moved to another apartment complex across the street, and he was he was actively shooting. He was shooting. We couldn't find where he was, and w- we were just kind of like, this is a scenario where this is an active shooter. So let's form up as an active shooter, but you're in a wide open space. So like if you're going to go through the corridors of the, of the apartment buildings or the apartment complex, well then maybe you need to be formed up. Otherwise you got to kind of spread out and you got to stay together in a line. And it's a pain in the ass to try to maintain that communication, uh, to try to find that shooter. Incidentally, I I don't, you know, spoiler alert, that guy, (laughs) that guy, it's not funny, but that guy went, he went to a house party that's how he blended in. That's how he hid. He he got everybody to move into one room and robbed everybody. He robbed like 40 people. And then as as some people were coming up, they confronted him and they thought it was a joke. And so they started messing with him. So he starts firing at them and he chased them back to their apartment, firing at them the whole time. That's what we heard. And um, it, it's just a very interesting case. So for the rest of the night, we were just kind of looking for this guy in, in, a, in a needle in a haystack. We didn't know if he was in other apartments raping other women or if he was shooting. You know, you know, obviously, we didn't hear gunshots, but it ended in a very uh, dramatic car chase that I was asleep for because I had gone home. I was on the midnight shift. Uh, I can't wait to cover that case. But Is that the uh, one that you showed a clip of last week where it was like LeVar Bates? Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely somebody in your family. I, I just don't remember the... <laughs> it's funny you say that, because uh, one time, uh, this is a little clip from Failure to Stop Hard Time. I met a guy in prison, and his name was Bates, and uh, I don't know if his name was LeVar, but it, it, we look at each other, and he sees my name on my shirt, and I look at his name on his door. I'm like, he looks at me, and we both kind of smile, and he goes like, you think my mama knows your mama? And it was just so funny. <laughs> uh, so... I, I I think this is an interesting case that presents some interesting scenarios. And uh, th- to include, just remember this, like some lessons learned here, like I'm not looking down on my nose at anybody. I, I've done it. I've committed every sin that was in this thing. And they didn't do a whole lot wrong, but you did have detectives that were had just come off of lunch. And, you know, they showed up. They didn't have any armor. Um that's that's the reality sometimes that's it's in your trunk or it's buried somewhere else and uh or you've jumped in to somebody else's car to go eat and your armor is in your car and yeah. you're there you're in the fight like you're still there you showed up you just don't have all the equipment that you you need like your rifle and all that other stuff um and and they they were still in the fight and the sergeant had a tourniquet the first thing the officer that was standing over to her with to her said where are you hit and where's your tourniquet? Boom. She produces a tourniquet and they start putting it on her. Always be ready for that. Be prepared. Carry that tourniquet now. Uh, I know that, that they're frequently um, issued in, in in some of the larger apartments. If you have to buy your own, buy your own. If you uh, look, if you're an ambitious officer and, and your department makes you buy your own, why don't you go to a business and say, hey, do you want to sponsor some uh, tourniquets and do a community service project? And you know, do something nice for them and maybe they'll sponsor you and, and buy you a bunch of tourniquets. Um, that's all I got, John. I mean, do you have anything else? No. So uh, you're going to be gone on a cruise next week. Why would you do that? It's like going to a hotel where you're not allowed to leave and all you can do is eat 
and the hotel moves and you stay in the hotel and then when you're done it's gone back to where you started and like every time you like google cruises in the news it's like you know man throws up every day on cruise or like you know, pirates <laughs> Pirates I've capture never seen cruise. Hold on, I've got ten more. Pirates <laughs> capture cruise vessel. Cruise vessel sunk by uh, German U-boats. Uh, cruise vessel lost in Bermuda Triangle. Cru cruise ve cruise ve cruises are terrible, Drew. What I what what, what there won't be bees. bees. There will no. be bees. There everything is sugary and sticky. The bees are going to go out to sea with you. I can't wait till you come back covered in welts. That's what's going to happen to you. <laughs> what a fascinating so podcast that says making people listen to bees, Drew. Okay, that's enough for bee talk. And I'm uh I, I am confident that John is gonna present a wonderful show for you next week, probably void of any uh insects whatsoever, let alone bees. Hey, we're not um, doing that. So um until next time, I am Drew Breezy. That's Jonathan, and we don't discuss his last name, but he is uh, at difficult to look at pictures on Instagram. I am at drew underscore breezy B R E A S Y, uh, on Instagram. Please follow us. Thank you for joining us. John, do me the favor. Stick around. Good night, everybody. <laughs>